All right, I think we're ready to begin. This uh, is our last plenary session on the future of autonomous systems. Uh, I'm David Shaw, and I'm the Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Mississippi State University, and I am a co-chair of this panel, along with Hayden Thompson, who we'll introduce in just a moment. Um, very much appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be in, actually in this position. Uh, yesterday and today, I feel like uh, in many ways have, have built uh, toward uh, this, this, in one sense, kind of being the culmination. We've talked about uh, big data, we've talked about cybersecurity, uh, talked about advanced communications, and talked about privacy policy. And uh, here we're going to be talking on a number of those aspects with the applications of, of autonomous systems. You uh, simply cannot uh, pick up a newspaper or go online any day and not see some conversation going on about the tremendous opportunity and the tremendous challenges uh, that we face with autonomous transportation, both uh, aerial and, and uh, ground-based uh, systems. Safety and privacy are particular concerns uh, that are expressed, but the untold opportunities and, and just simply the imagination that's going into the applications of these technologies uh, really lead to a tremendous amount of excitement. We have a, a wonderful panel that's a, a mixture of uh, the European and American interests, academia and industry, and so I'm very much looking forward to the conversation that we'll be able to have. Uh, this morning I've asked each one to give a little bit of, uh, of their own background from their perspective as it, as it uh, leads to uh, the position that they represent today. Our first speaker this morning will be Al Severus from the Center of Autonomous and Cyber-Physical Systems at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom. Our second speaker is Dallas Brooks, who is the dire <coughs> director of our RASPIT Flight Research Laboratory at Mississippi State University. Um, Hayden Thompson, who is the CEO of the Think Group in the EU, um, is our third speaker. And then finally, Malcolm Glenn, who is the director of strategic partnerships with Uber Technologies here in the United States. Uh, we, I've asked each to speak for about 15 minutes so that we make sure that we have plenty of time uh, for questions uh, both from the audience and conversation amongst ourselves. So with that, Al. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dave said, uh, I'm Al Savaris. I'm from Cranfield University in the UK. We are just about half an hour north of London. Uh, we are postgraduate university research, so um, most of the work we do is really uh, on research projects, the majority of the work. Uh, we have uh, a couple of campuses. We have the defense college and the civilian side as well at Cranfield. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you today about is just to uh, give a, a very short presentation, about 10, 15 minutes, to just describe some of the issues and challenging about uh, aerial platforms, uh, specifically uh, the unmanned ones. It's very difficult to uh, try to cram too much in a very short presentation, so, um, but it just gives you a flavor of the things that we are looking at and the things, some of the challenges going into the future. So looking at the history, um, just a timeline to give you an idea as to where we are with regards to unmanned systems. So if we look at the manned aircraft starting from uh, the beginning of the 1914 and so on, um, and if we put a parallel axis to that one with regards to unmanned systems, you can see, um, to give you an idea regarding the comparison as how fast uh, those platforms have been developing and moving forward uh, into the future from this point of view. So what, what you can see here, and it's specifically, it's one of the greatest uh, uh, growing areas here in unmanned system, and I put that chart here specifically uh, from Tractica, and basically this is not about the growth that you'll see in all the uh, other graphs that you see, but an actual revenue that is expected over the uh, 2015 to 2025 period, and you can see this one here in terms of uh, how many billions we expect and the majority of growth is really 
uh, as you expect in the U.S., Europe, and uh, the Far East, and, and basically China, Japan, and these kind of uh, areas where, where there's a lot of interest, especially for maritime surveillance, for environmental surveillance, and those sort of uh, applications. And if we are to try to break down, uh, to give you an idea of where, ha where the majority of, or some of the application where these people uh, were expecting it to go forward from here is, um, as you can see here, the breakdown, and a lot of it really actually to do with Earth observations, and the other bit is really to do with the border and security and surveillance. Uh, especially this is, uh, uh, there's many projects being uh, going on in, the, in Europe within Horizon uh, Program and Security, and the European Defense Agency, which is looking at uh, uh, monitoring and surveying the Mediterranean uh, for um, illegal refugees. And as I mentioned to, to you and, and following on from these conversations we've been having for the last couple of days, what you can see, it's really the, mo the main enabler uh, of this uh, technology has been the enormous growth really in sensors. So if we are to look, if to, we are to correlate how sensors have been developing over the last 50 years, and we do a line here to compare to the autonomous systems, you can see that the majority of the uh, development has happened in the last 20, 30 years and is mainly driven by the sensors because the sensors open new areas of applications. And with new areas of applications means that we are able to use those platforms to carry out more missions and more complex missions. And this is now is, is driving being exponential. Of course, we don't like this at some point will flatten out, but we're moving to different type of sensors, different kind of applications, uh, but maybe we can have that in the conversation. The other slide I wanted to, to show to you here is with regards when we look at the unit cost uh, versus the number of units that are being produced. And again, looking at the two major drivers uh, have been uh, the automotive industry and the mobile. And wh what is interesting about this is how you can see how the magnitude of the cost drops as the number of units gets into hundreds of millions and so on. But what is interesting here, and the point I want to mention here, is that we still have only just started to get into the IoT. So IoT, had up to this point, or uh, as, and to 2016, hasn't really uh, been a major contribution into the drone or unmanned systems area, uh, autonomous systems. But this is something that what we expect will drive the next uh, if you like, revolution in terms of the use of autonomous systems. But of course, um, as you all know and you heard on the news, et cetera, unfortunately, the word drones have a bad uh, reputation, but you know, there is quite a lot of challenges. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm not, these are the typical uh, challenges we used to have 20, 30 years ago, trying to get those platforms up in the air. However, these are now, most of them, have been addressed or we are quite advanced in terms of understanding how these platforms behave and we can get quite easily them up in the air for various missions. However, what the big challenge now is for us is how we can integrate those into our airspace. So, of course, if we talk about small platforms, uh, remotely piloted platforms, then we are down here at the low risk. But when we're talking about an autonomous passenger aircraft or a cargo aircraft, then we're talking about full UAS integration to the airspace. And to, just to give you an idea, uh, there is a lot of uh, interest at the moment, especially from driven by the uh, group in the Netherlands in Europe, where we're looking at, where they're looking at how we can use other corridors that are not used currently uh, for passenger jets, like for example, over the uh, Arctic, uh, in order to have a cargo airplane operating in that kind of airspace. But what's ha what is clear from here is that we cannot just move straightly into a completely autonomous platform, but it will be a step moving towards that. So, and a lot of this is really uh, because of the regulation. So, the reason why uh, at the moment things haven't uh, been moving so fast uh, as we get with, for example, with the autonomous cars, is, is our perception, if you like, or society's expectation about safety. 
So if we look now back in 1945, uh, we look at how the public demand for safety assurance, and you compare that to if we look here in today or 2018, you can see for the different platforms what the public demand for safety compared to what it used to be in 1945 for the different platforms. And of course, when it comes into people getting into aircraft, etc., we are right here at the limit of you know, zero risk because we all try to get to where we want safely. <laughs> so what are the, some of the key challenges we're facing at the moment? Of course, certification and standards. So this is it's the typical uh, areas at the moment where there's a lot of work and some collaboration between the US, of course, and, uh, and Europe going on into this area. But the other ch challenges of thought is regarding with the decision-making system. Because if a platform gonna be certified or a standard being established in the US or in Europe, and this platform has to travel from one place to the other, then we need to make sure that you know, these platforms are compatible and the systems are, you know, we're able to have some traceability and then as we move forward, a lot of these technologies as well are also applicable because of the cost to manned aviation. Um, I've just briefly uh, have a, ch uh, a slide on this one, and this is basically the reason why I put this one. This is, a, this is one of the biggest program I'm aware of uh, that f uh, had three stages, uh, which finished about, the third stage finished about four years ago. It's called Astrea. And this is looking at civilian side of getting unmanned uh, air system and technologies into non-segregated airspace. And to give you an idea about this program, it is just around uh, 90 million, uh, equivalent of 90 million US dollars or close to 100 million US dollars. Uh, we've involved uh, uh, all the major companies in, in the UK, uh, academia, and research institutes. So, as I explained to you before um, in the previous slide, uh, what we were looking for is not the technology about you know, your guidance, your autopilot, and all that sort of thing, your flight control system, but there's our new challenges that are coming nowadays into the new type of aerial systems. And I wanna emphasize those two areas you see there on the left-hand side, which is really uh, the unmanned traffic management, and that is a big hot topic area. Um, at Cranfield, we're investing, uh, we're building a new center called DARTEC, Digital Aviation Research Center, and we're investing 100 million, um, equivalent to 100 million US dollars uh, in building that center together with uh, five industrial partners and a 50-50 contribution between um, uh, the research uh, council and the industrial partners, uh, for example, Talis, uh, uh, Raytheon, and so on. And one of the things we're looking for here is how can we get, uh, I'll show you a little video of some of the ideas that I got from, uh, we get it there from about concept of how those systems will work in, uh, in the current airspace. And the other thing which is very of interest is, you know, a lot of the people, as you see, the sexy words nowadays about AI. And well, how can we certify uh, AI system which are not de deterministic? And finally, regarding connectivity, this is again linked to the, our dark tech. And what we're looking for, and we got some projects working already on this one, is looking on cognitive uh, radios, software-defined radios, uh, 5Gs, and Aeromax. And our main interest really here is uh, quality of service, depending on the traffic. So we need to start thinking slightly different about uh, how do we see in the future UTM compared to what we have at the moment with ATM. So at the moment you have your air traffic management, which all centralized, but if we're gonna be looking into the future in UTM, then we need to start thinking about maybe a different way of how we do that. And what, we, what I mean by that, a decentralized approach. Um, um, so that's a short video. Uh, from uh, One Sky, uh, just to give you an idea about uh, the concept of what we ha how do we see UTM being integrated um, in the airspace. So you have your, all your no TAMs, no go areas, etc., and so on. And then this is a typical uh, approach. For example, in a, s a small SME or a, or a, an end user wants to get an 
uh, from point A to point B, and then he can sit there and plant that on a, on, on a little interface. So you can see there's a no-go zones and wherever there's no time, then he can put the waypoints as to where he would like to go, et cetera, and so on. And the altitudes, of course, uh, whether it's a fixed altitude or, or different, taking the terrain into account. And then you have the uh, UAV flying out there uh, to do the, the mission, uh, flying from point A to point B. Another issue which has really been skewing uh, the development of unmanned systems, and I'll just finish that with my last couple of slides really, it's the security. There's a lot of concern at the moment when it comes to security, um, especially with uh, regards to the security agencies and how we can um, control or monitor all these unmanned uh, platforms that are flying out there. And really not the big ones, but we're looking at those little small quadcopter ones that are flying out there, and that is a big issue. What is interesting there to see is that you nowadays you have a whole industry, and this is expected to grow by 2024 to 2 billion uh, US dollars, which is looking at how we have, a, if you like, an anti-drone industry of how we can bring those things down, whether it's using lasers, which seems to be uh, one of the most uh, promising approaches at the moment, and some other electronic countermeasure, et cetera, and so on. Uh, but you can see how, how things at the moment are changing in this landscape uh, of us not developing the platforms but maybe controlling them or bring them down. So some of the some of the issues here we have. So in the past, we're talking about you know some of the policy changes. So we're talking about here some of the vehicles in the in the in the old days we used to be you know how we can get those uh, a single pilot sing flying a single platform and that sort of thing. Today we're talking a little bit about swarms and having a pilot flying maybe multiple vehicles, talking about the certification aspects, you know, and operating beyond line of sight in order to open this uh, commercial um, avenues for these platforms. And what is interesting is where we're going into the future. Okay, so talking about, you know, maybe a new certification process where AI is part of it, for example, about the data, who owns the data, would you allow people to fly over your houses? Would this platform need to fly over the roads? That sort of thing. Uh, privacy, of course, the communication. We heard about 5G earlier and so on. And I cannot say much about it, but there will be an announcement, a very exciting announcement in this area at the Farnborough Air Show. So keep an eye on this for next month about uh, personal air transport. And with that, um, I'd like to finish my presentation and thank you for listening. Pardon? Yeah. So he, his question was, uh, who will make the announcement? Um, I cannot say now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's to a be UK. There. It's an it's a, it's it will be done by the UK. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Dallas Brooks. Hello everyone, I'm Dallas Brooks from the Raspit Flight Research Laboratory at Mississippi State University. Um, we do a lot of unmanned aircraft systems work at, uh, at Raspit. Uh, walked in this job about two years ago, um, and it's been full speed ever since, so it's been fairly enjoyable. Whoa, apparently I'm freaking out the machine. There we go. That's me. Um, I've got a little bit of a... Um, very background, uh, 26 years in the Air Force, the last seven of which was at the Pentagon. Uh, I had a series, excuse me, a series of jobs um, where basically I was the first to do just about everything that in unmanned aircraft systems the whole time I was there. So I was the first Air Force Chief of UAS Integration. Um, I was the first Chair of the Office of Secretary of Defense UAS Task Force. Um, I was the first DOD FAA liaison on unmanned aircraft systems, and so I was sort of writing my own job description as I went. 
I wish, man, I got to leave a lot of the boring parts out and just do the parts that I found interesting, which was uh, which is a lot of fun. You don't normally get opportunities like that at the Pentagon very often where you get to be somewhat creative and sort of define your own path. But uh, it, it was a very fulfilling seven years for me. And uh, were it not for the birth of, uh, of our son, uh, we probably would still be here. But um, one of my challenges is I have a speech impediment. Um, I, have a, uh, I can't say the word no. So when people <laughs> keep asking me to do things, I, I, I keep doing them, right? So I ended up with a, a lot of different jobs. So uh, in addition to my, my, my day job, which is the director of RASPIT, um, I'm also the sitting chairman of the board for AUVSI, which is the largest trade association in the world for unmanned systems. Um, I'm also the associate director for the FAA's UAS Center of Excellence, which is a consortium of 24 universities, uh, both national and international, uh, that the FAA uses to do directed research on key UAS integration topics. Um, and then I co-chair, you, you can see this alphabet soup here, it's a very long string, but uh, I co-chair an outfit called the UAS Science and Research Panel. And that, um, that was born, uh, actually I, I co-founded this, um, in DOD uh, back in 2011, and back then it was just to get the four services on the same page about how we were doing UAS integration, detect and avoid, things like that, because everyone was off doing their own thing. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to, to take all their money and then say, you're not going to get it back until we start working together a little bit better. Um, it was an effective approach. It worked. Um, we, we began laying out um, structures, all the major muscle movements for detect and avoid, our systems development strategies, all those things to, the, to where they, even though the purposes were slightly different for the services, we got the opportunity to say, here's our framework. So work within this framework, we'll have a certain amount of compatibility across systems, but more importantly, we'll have a lexicon. Well, when we say that this is this, we'll know that that's what it means. And that was a, a big challenge early on in detect and avoid. Um, so with any success, things start to grow. So uh, once we started um, being fairly successful in defining some key terms, such as what does it mean to be well clear um, between a, an unmanned system and a, and a manned system? How, in other words, how much do you have to miss by? Um, other agencies started saying, hey, wait a second, can we get in on this? And so it went from DOD to DOD and FAA, and then DHS, and then NASA, and then most recently we've added interior justice, commerce, and energy. So, you know, the last four don't have a lot of money in their UAS programs, but they, they do want to um, participate in the research and help set the priorities. Uh, I can tell you Interior is doing a lot with small UAS, uh, particularly in fire, firefighting, wildfires. And um, uh, Commerce, mainly NOAA, is, is, are, are their, uh, their, their major UAS uh, customers. Um, Energy does a lot, uh, obviously, for um, some of the, the things that they do everywhere from uh, they're, they're using unmanned systems for nuclear verification, for example. Um, let's see, formerly, see, UAS integration chair for the OSD, I talked about that a little bit. Um, military director for the policy board on federal aviation, that was a fun job. Um, so the policy board is a um, consortium of the, f of the air chiefs of all four services. So the DCS Air for the Marine Corps, the, the A A30 for the Air Force, whoever runs the air for each of the services um, is the representative to the policy board. And so those general officers um, get together and they decide, here's what we need to be able to do, here's how we need to be able to fly, um, and then the policy board works out with the FAA how they're gonna do that. So if you have a, a unique military requirement, for example, that you need to be able to fly really high and break a couple rules while you're doing that and you need to be able to coordinate that with the FAA, that coordination is done through the policy board. And we also do a lot of waivers for military aircraft that are just not gonna get updated with uh, new types of technology, for example. Um, my lab, we have two 55,000, or yeah, 55,000 square foot hangars. Um, one is dedicated to advanced composites materials uh, research and development and the other is dedicated to unmanned aircraft systems. Um, I'll talk about the UAS here because that's, uh, that's what we're here to talk about. So federal UAS research, that compromises, or I'm sorry, that comprises about uh, about 80% of RASPIT's funded research. It's, it's on the federal side. Um, our customers, and you see a lot of them up there. The FAA is a big one, DHS a big one. Uh, we work with NOAA, we work with the Office of Naval Research, US Geological Survey, um, uh, the Naval Ocean, uh, Oceanography and Meteorology Command, uh, and then ASSURE, which is the consortium of, uh, of universities that, that I talked to you about, that's the FAA UAS Center of Excellence. 
I'll start with the DHS piece. This was sort of a, a national competition uh, to, to win this. Um, DHS had been doing some very limited uh, uh, UAS sort of tests and evaluation. They had taken this on as sort of a science project. Uh, what they found were that a lot of local law enforcement agencies, disaster relief agencies were going out and they were buying unmanned aircraft systems with no true understanding of whether or not they could fly them or how they could fly them or when they could fly them and without a good grasp of which systems were best suited for mission needs. And so DHS Science and Technology Division took a, a look at that and said, we can help with this. So they staked out some, uh, some land at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and they started to basically invite UAS vendors in to demonstrate their capabilities within the context of DHS mission sets. So it might be a Secret Service mission set. You know, it might be Homeland Security, um, I mean, uh, um, Border Protection. It might be First Responders Group. It might be any of those things. So in a disaster relief scenario, they might have a, you know, a flood, flood scenario, simulated flood scenario, and say, show me how your system is going to perform in doing the assessment of the conditions, the triage of the damage, things of that nature um, in, in a flood scenario. And do that again for a wildfire scenario. And do that again for a Secret Service uh, shooter scenario. And as they refine these use cases and, and vendors came in and, and had a very targeted way of saying, this is what we think we can do for you, they sort of built a database, sort of a consumer reports book, actually, on if, you're, if you've got this mission, this is probably your best combination of sensor and unmanned systems. For this mission, here's your best combination, and here's why. So the reports ended up being fairly detailed and very helpful to the law enforcement and first responder communities. But DHS wanted to blow this up. So rather than doing little, little exercises in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, they wanted to do full-on major exercises with UAS running over the top. So it became not about the UAS anymore. It, be it became about a full-scale border protection exercise and with UAS incorporated. And so they wanted to do that with flood, with fire, with chemical spill, with rail disaster, with highway disaster, with presidential movement. They wanted to do everything that the agency did, full speed, fully staffed, anywhere from 40 to 4,000 actors and with UAS over the top. And that was a major, major endeavor. So the state of Mississippi bid on this. Uh, we put together a statewide team. Um, you can see some of the mission sets that were there. Uh, DHS was serious when they said we wanted to do a rail disaster. Part of what you had to write to was we were going to take a real train and we're going to push it over. <laughs> and then we're going to run our scenario and then we're going to clean it up when we're done. Uh, they wanted underground train scenarios as well. They wanted, uh, you know, again, you had to be able to flood an area with buildings in it. I mean, this was major infrastructure stuff. Um, so our partnership was built, uh, headquartered out of Mississippi State University, um, but primarily focused on the southern part of Mississippi because we have some fantastic assets there. Uh, Camp Shelby Joint Forces Training Center, it's been around 100 years. They do everything. You can blow things up there. You can shoot things. Um, you can set things on fire. Um, you can run UAS over the top of all that because they have restricted airspace. Um, <laughs> Let me tell you, it's, it's fun blowing stuff up. It really is. <laughs> I don't care who you are. When you, when you blow something up, it's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> Singing River Island um, is the former Pascagoula Naval Air Station, and so it, it is literally an island just off the coast. Um, long bridge that goes to it. That base was closed about 10 years ago and it, uh, went well preserved. It didn't, they didn't let it go to seed. And so I've got this fantastic facility where I can go launch off the, the southern coast of an island and have the entire Gulf of Mexico as my playground. And I'll talk about the airspace situation there in just a second. And then our friends at Santa Space Center because uh, NASA is NASA and they bring a lot of good things to the table. So, so I, I talked about airspace. One of the things we've built over the last two years at RASPIT is, is one of the, the most robust airspace capabilities in, in the world uh, for UAS operations. Um, everybody says they have airspace. No matter who you talk, oh yeah, we got tons of airspace. Problem is they can't access it, at least not with an unmanned aircraft. So your airspace has to be very specifically characterized for unmanned systems. Uh, in the US, that means ACOA, which is an FAA instrument that is essentially a waiver to fly unmanned aircraft systems. Or you can be in restricted airspace, which uh, is government owned, and uh, is prohibited from other aircraft from entering into it. So if, you're, if you have permission to be inside of it, you can do essentially whatever you want. And that's a lot of fun as well. 
Um, and then we have things called warning areas, which is sort of restricted airspace that's offshore over the water. And they start about 13 miles out off the coast. Um, so between COA airspace, which is FAA designated for UAS use, restricted and warning areas, um, you know, we've, we're running, what, six, eight, yeah, about 8,000 square miles, uh, anywhere from the surface to 60,000 feet, depending on where we are. Um, we spend a lot of time laying that groundwork, tremendous amount of coordination. Um, we have letters of agreement with uh, the applicable FAA centers, with all the military agencies, so we can fly what we need to fly almost anywhere we need to fly, and that includes beyond visual line of sight, which we can do in both the restricting and warning areas. So big aircraft going very long distances um, with corridors in between some of our COAs, so we can leave a COA. You see the corridor there between Starkville and, uh, and Ackerman, uh, the little box in the line. We're, we're looking at uh, increasing our corridors to where they span the entire state. So we've been very fortunate to, to have a great working relationship with the FAA um, and have the ability to fly almost anywhere we want to fly. Uh, again, we, we focus on larger aircraft. The one I'm showing you here is the Outlaw G2. It's about, uh, it says 150 pound gross takeoff. Ours are beefed up, so they're really about 180. 30 pound payload uh, for our models and um, 15 foot wingspan. So all of, my, all of my stats are actually wrong because we bought the, the souped up version. Um, six hour endurance and a 50 mile range. Uh, and that's, that range is not, that's as far as it can fly. That range is as far as you can get from the antenna. Um, day night operation. Uh, we're, we're adding to our capability this fall, picking up two new um, Navmar Tiger Sharks. These are about 500-pound aircraft, carry about 100-pound payload for about 12 hours. Ground control station, 28-foot. Uh, it's it, Everything that's built into there, we built into it ourselves. Uh, two simultaneous operations at any given time can be con conducted from this station. We roll out the trailer, uh, generators, everything self-contained. So whenever we get somewhere, it takes us about 45 minutes to set up and we're ready to fly. I had a great video that went along with this and I didn't copy it on, it's a shame, but uh, uh, two minutes long. This is uh, Dauphin Island, Alabama, which is a fantastic place to fly unmanned systems. Uh, 3,000 foot runway, as you can tell, sticks out into the water. Uh, as soon as you get off the departure end and hang a left, you're in the Gulf. And uh, since we have permission to fly from literally one end of the Gulf to the other uh, from the FAA, we were able to do a tremendous amount of research with the twin engine uh, Griffin Sea Hunter aircraft. So we did bathymetry with LIDAR, um, mapped a, a good deal of the uh, Mississippi Gulf Coast um, for the Office of Naval Research. The FAA UAS Center of Excellence, this is probably one of the most important initiatives that the FAA has, has come up with um, and certainly the most productive for UAS integration. So the FAA's track record on UAS integration is, is a bit spotty uh, and, and tends to take a lot of time. It's, uh, it's glacial, actually, in, in progress in some ways. But uh, this, this, this is where they got it right. So the FAA has centers of excellence for a lot of things. There's one on general aviation airports. There's one on commercial space transportation. There's one on advanced materials uh, for aviation uh, manufacture. Um, and at one point, uh, the decision was made that, that we need a center of excellence for amend aircraft systems. All the centers of excellence follow a similar model. They're, they're a consortium of universities, usually leading in their field in, in whatever their particular area of interest is. Um, they band together, form a team. They're centrally run with one lead. And the FAA gens up, here's our research requirements, um, hands them over to the Center of Excellence, who parcels them out to the appropriate universities based on you know, the, their, their core capabilities, the ones that are best suited for that kind of work. Uh, the universities bring match to the table in this arrangement. So if the FAA is kicking in, $400,000 for a project, and the university is expected to match that with $400,000 in value. And that can be actual dollars, that can be uh, faculty time, that can be industry contributions, uh, both time and money. Um, but it provides fantastic value for the government. And it allowed the FAA to immediately put key researchers on a lot of these fundamental problems that we have when we try to integrate them in aircraft systems. Uh, here's our, our membership list. Like I said, it's, uh, it's 24 total, and uh, there's, I think there's four or five international. Um, Concordia, the Tec Technion, Southampton. Um, there was one other, I think, that did not make the slide. But uh, Mississippi State University is the lead agency for the Assure FAA US Center of Excellence. To date, um, you can look at the list of some of the research projects that we've either led or, or participated in from, uh, from a Mississippi State perspective. Um, 
The top one is a brand new one, just, just awarded. So they have asked us to anticipate the, the, the Amazon vision. So e-commerce networks, our transportation engineers are going to build the model for aerial drone delivery networks across the country. Um, it's going to include ties in, tie, tie-ins with uh, logistics centers, ground and air, uh, airports, trucking. Um, f- the literally, we'll, we'll model where those 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 drones will be um, uh, working from the distribution centers, uh, their ideal routes to get them to the areas of highest traffic, which would be in, in a lot of you know a lot of areas that's uh, your your more upscale suburbs of folks that are paying for that kind of delivery. Um, we're going to do the safety analysis to say here where are the here are the challenges that we see. Here's the risk factors. Uh, we'll have to quantify those. Uh, the model that we build is intended to be flexible and reusable, um, to where we can literally change five, six, seven variables and see what that does to the safety equation. So that's uh, that's going to be an interesting project for us. Uh, take us about two and a half years to get the whole thing built, but it's going to be fun. Um, Two of the most important things that we've done, ground collision and airborne collision severity, um, no one ever knew how bad it is when a UAS hits something. So we had all sorts of data on what happens when, a, for example, the Range Commander's Council, what happens when a piece of shrapnel hits you, what happens when a softball hits you, what happens when another blunt object hits you. But what happens when a UAS hits you? Is it, is it the same thing? And there, there, just, there just weren't any data. So... The Assure Coalition got together, and we literally started, first we built the computer modeling piece of it, and then we started firing UAS and components of UAS out of a cannon at various things, right? And then we dropped UAS onto the heads of crash test dummies. And then we dropped UAS onto the heads of human cadavers. Kid you not, I I didn't do that research myself, (laughs) thankfully. Um, Because it turns out that uh, you have to have a fresh unfrozen cadaver if you're going to measure the shock wave that goes to the brain in a concussive event. And concussive is one of the issues for uh, UAS trauma. Um, laceration is another, blunt force trauma. Um, so the, uh, the true measure of what could happen to you when a UAS strikes a human body, depending on where it strikes you, how fast it's going, how it's built, what it's made of, is it frangible, is it not frangible, where the engine is, huge thing. And then we did the same set of tests against what it, um, when a UAS hap- uh, happens to hit a, an aircraft, right? So it hits a windshield, goes through a jet engine, right? Hits the leading edge of a wing, and what happens? Again, materials become extraordinarily important. One of the things we found was that a rear engine UAS does less than a third of the damage of a front engine because that center of mass in the front with a sharp propeller shaft uh, will just drill right into anything. It'll absolutely destroy it. Whereas a rear engine UAS, whatever's on the nose, it's usually the payload, um, when it strikes, the mass is towards the back. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to move up, start to move out. It's going to deflect. And so that simple design consideration of front or rear uh, literally triples your damage in an impact situation. And so this kind of research is already affecting how people build UAS because they know that if they build the same UAS front engine, their chances of getting it certified in certain situations are not what what it might otherwise be. Uh, We're a FAUAS test site through a partnership with Pan Pacific. Um, This this allows us uh, to be able to bid on certain projects for the FAA and for for NASA. we, we already had tremendous capability walking in the door, so we were invited to join their team as, as part of um, uh, a coalition, for lack of a better term, uh, to build a super site. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> Hayden Thompson will be our next speaker, and shifting gears and going towards the ground vehicles. Well, actually, you shouldn't need to shift the gears. <laughs> should be all done. <laughs> all right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about autonomous ground vehicles. Uh, my background... Oh, sorry. I'll go down. I'm quite short. Uh, so, so my background is quite unusual as well, because I started my career in flight control systems. I've worked for the U.S. Army, firing lasers at stuff. You don't get big explosions. You just drill a hole through things. Uh 
I've also worked on the Joint Strike Fighter on the lift system for that. I've designed flight control systems, Boeing. I've done all sorts of stuff. And I ran a research centre for Rolls-Royce for 20 years and ran something like 400 projects during that time on lots of different technologies, including some on Astrea as well. So I've been involved in many of these programmes and also on the military programme about Suave, which is another programme in the UK. So today I'm going to say something like this. The Warner. Oh, right, okay. That's why I can't say. <laughs> so, quickly, something about Think then. So, Think is a company which is based in Europe, in the UK, and in uh, the Netherlands. We also have a branch in uh, Japan, and we also have our autonomous systems uh, division out in Australia. Why Australia? Because there's a lot of open space, and we, there's not too many regulations for overflying and things like that. Uh, and the key thing we're interested in is smart anything everywhere and any time as well. So we're really interested in providing monitoring or trying to get data from A to B in some way. And we work in lots of different areas. We work in Formula One. Uh, whoops. We work in Formula One. We work in the nuclear monitoring area, self-powered systems. We work with NASA on some stuff in remote monitoring. We have these microgenerators. There's a video of this, but I won't show you. Basically, as you shake it, it generates power. It generates power. We're interested in sort of self-powered devices for the future. We are also interested in UAVs uh, in the oceans, but also uh, UAVs for flying around. And we're also interested in uh, Internet of Things and getting data from A to B. So we actually have an interest in big data, IoT, 5G, all of these different technologies. Uh, so if I go on there. And we're also doing some interesting stuff even looking for sharks off the Australian coast as well, using UAVs. And it would be quite interesting to see whether you could fly a UAV into the shark and see if it could some damage to it as well. <laughs> that, might be, that might be quite useful. It's uh, almost as fun as blowing yeah, stuff up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we're interested in lots of weird and wonderful applications. Uh, now, I'm coming today to talk about uh, automotive area. I am... I also work in the automotive sector quite a lot. I work for the European Commission quite often. Most of my time I spend in Brussels covering things like AI, the automotive sector side. I sort of cover autonomous cars for the European Commission and also for the European Parliament as an advisor. And also other areas like 5G, big data in those areas. I also have a, some oversight in that area as well. Uh, so the thing we see in autonomous cars is basically that we're seeing things which are quite common across a number of areas. We're getting autonomy in cars, in the train area, also in aircraft, as we've seen, and also in ships as well. And so we're finding that increasingly we're designing the human out of the loop in the control of these systems. Now, that requires the technologies to do that, and we need to be able to, able to do that. And here we get into areas like AI and all these other uh, technologies. We're also interested in optimising traffic flow. So congestion is a big problem. So you sort of saw some of the maps there for aircraft where they're flying around, there's all the restricted zones and things. If you look at the number of drones, which are around by 2015, about uh, a million, I believe, you know, by 2015. So there's lots of these things flying around, and it's a big issue. We find with autonomous cars, we need to try and uh, deal with the optimization of traffic flow. We have the same sort of problems in the rail sector. Also, the aircraft sector, we're looking at 4D traffic management and also traffic management for the oceans as well, particularly in areas where it's uh, very, very congested. And the other key area is, is actually health monitoring. So we also want to monitor systems as well. So these systems are very complicated, but what we want to do is try and increase capacity. We want to get greater safety for systems. So what the key thing that's driving the use of autonomous uh, technologies is to try and improve the safety of the overall systems. And we also, also have an, a benefit from the environment, environmental uh, benefits as well, re reducing emissions. Now, the big challenge, really, is that if you look at the global car fleet, it's predicted to be double, actually, to buy 1.6 billion vehicles by 2030. And we know that's not sustainable, not with the existing infrastructure we have. So without integration of information and flow control systems, we're going to have severe congestion. All of our cities will be clogged up. Our motorways will be clogged up. So we need to do something. And indeed, this is seen as a big market. Already by 2020, they're predicted it's nearly $18 billion, this market. And it's expected to grow. So it's, it's good news. It, all of these challenges are always opportunities. Okay, so the uh, first thing which is interesting is the communications in this area. And so it must be said in Europe they've been working on uh, communications, car-to-infrastructure and car-to-car -car communications and a standard for this for about 10 or 15 years already. And there are various different standards being talked about. So you have WAVE in the US, we have 
ITS uh, G5 in, the, in Europe and various other things floating around. Uh, but the critical issue is really that the car market is global markets. If you're selling cars, you're not just selling in Europe or America, you're also selling in Japan, China, etc. So you need to think about the worldwide market for these. So you need a global standard that everyone can agree on. And the other thing which has been noted really is that if you're talking about putting wireless communications into infrastructure, really the lead in this will be from countries where they have significant private infrastructure where they will invest in this. So you're looking at countries like Italy, you're looking at countries like France, this is a bit in Europe, uh, Norway, et cetera, where they can invest in the technology. Okay, now the thing which I must say that is driving the communications connections to cars is really the infotainment industry at the moment. It's not so much the autonomous car industry, it's the infotainment industry. And this is where we hear about 5G, we talk about transferring, getting TV to your phone, et cetera. Now there's two types of connection. We find that the we sort of we have these embedded connections in cars, but actually most people these days just put their smartphone in the car and have a tethered connection. And that has all sorts of advantages. So a few years ago you would have had a TomTom -tom with your maps on it. Now you use the Google Maps, I'm sure. Now that's interesting because TomTom, -tom, if you use a product like TomTom, -tom, you then get into product liability. So if they get it wrong and you drive off the road somewhere or go to the wrong place, it's their problem and you can sue them. With Google, you can't do a thing because they're just private providing an app. So it's a bit of an unfair playing field for some of these technologies. Similarly, we find with music apps is that people it's replaced the radio which you would have in the car, and so we get in these connections. So there's lots of advantages for this. Also for the automotive companies, they can do recall on uh, different uh, applications. There's a lot of software in a car these days, about 90 million lines of software, typically in a, in a modern car. And they also can analyze the performance of cars as they're running. And a lot of car companies are doing this now to actually understand how their cars are operating out in service. And also they're looking for ways to actually cross-sell products uh, for the future. So the infotainment market is big. Uh, so the connected car market is big. And we're sort of seeing they're talking about, okay, about 82% of cars will be connected by 2021, which is a lot of cars. It's gonna go by a factor of 10 uh, from 2015. So we're talking about a lot of cars uh, going to be connected in the future with a big market potential for that. If you look at the lead companies in this, it's companies like BMW, Daimler, etc., and General Motors. Uh, now, the question mark is, is who's going to make the money out of this? Uh, so we're providing this connectivity, but it's actually other companies like Microsoft, Apple, Pandora, Google, etc., who are likely to actually make the money out of this uh, change. Now, when we get to autonomous cars, there's different levels of autonomy. Now, you may well have seen this before, but basically, currently, we're at the level of we've got automatic braking systems, we've got lane keeping control in cars. As we move to the next level, we've got to a level basically where we still have a steering wheel, so we can take over control if something goes wrong. If we go to the final level of this, which is level four, we get rid of the steering wheel altogether and there's nothing you can do. You're just sat there as a passenger and you just hope that the system works. <laughs> uh, now that's okay because we're designing these cars for people who may be disabled or might have limited mobility in the future but it may be that they might be drunk or something like that. So you probably don't <coughs> want them taking over the control of the car. Now, in terms of the technology, there's different levels of technology. And most of the car companies, it must be said, have developed a, a lot of the technology to enable this to happen. So all the sensor technology is pretty much in place for this. Uh, and if you look at the predicted opportunities, if you break it down into the different tiers, like LiDAR, radar, optical cameras, et cetera, all of that technology is there. Uh, but the challenge is to try and reduce the cost of that technology at the moment because we're very much at the, it's down to the last cent in the automotive industry. The key thing to note, though, is this black band here. That's the software, and that is the really big opportunity for the future. It's in all of the control software for these systems, and so that's where people are positioning themselves. It's a huge market, and we can see that, okay, we're talking about billions here, uh, and we sort of see that there's lots of different things we're talking about in terms of the different levels where we might actually provide that. Okay, there are some barriers as well. So there's lots of advantages. We talk about saving lives. We talk about fuel savings. We talk about traffic congestion. We talk about uh, economic stimulus to, to, to countries. Uh, but there's also challenges. The challenges are things like uh, consumer acceptance, so trust of these systems. Would you step out in front of an autonomous car? Would you sit in it and let it drive you somewhere? There's some interesting videos on the web of people who've sort of sat in these cars and get totally freaked out by the concept. Uh, the high cost of the technologies. So there's, there's two things here. First of all, the cost of putting, making a fully autonomous car is still quite high. The Google car, for instance, is about $150,000 of strap-on kit you need to put onto the car. 
but also there's there's things like okay the we we can put in these fancy processing boards into cars but they consume a lot of power at the minute uh, so we've we've achieved a lot with convolution neural networks and image processing and things like that but if you talk about electric cars it will be a major drain on the battery so we need to have much lower uh, consumption and and typically they're talking about 400 gigabits per second of data uh, being transferred around the car so there's an awful lot of data which needs to move around uh, the big concern though is okay when we roll these cars out in into the, the everyday traffic because we're going to have a mixture of cars if everything was autonomous it would be great it would make life easy but because we're mixing with uh, manned drivers and we don't really know how they're going to react then that is a challenge and we're going to have accidents there's no doubt we're going to have accidents and so the question is how how do we deal with that because every accident will be high profile in the press as we've already seen uh, but you've got to weigh that up against the the ethical question of the fact that if you reduce the overall deaths on the road by a factor and you're talking about savings hundreds of lives and hundreds of accidents every day uh, if you weigh that up against a few accidents that might happen in the future you need to think about that so uh, there's a need for intensive real-time monitoring as well because if something suddenly stops if a car suddenly stops in the middle of the road you need to know about it and so we go then get back into the issues of privacy and so we, we have to take more information about the cars about who's who's actually in the car where they're going etc and it could also be used for law enforcement for how fast they're driving if they're breaking breaking uh, uh, speed limits etc so do people trust these systems so it's quite interesting because there was a survey performed in the US of one and a half thousand drivers and also executives of, of companies and the interesting thing was that actually 55 percent so over half of them said they would actually buy a fully autonomous car within five years which is a surprise uh, and the remainder of them almost all of the remainder of them said they would do so in a 10-year time frame so people are more accepting of the technology than you might think now the big problem is okay how much are you going to pay for that and so at the moment about 20 percent would pay five thousand for this for some of the features so th there's a need to think about okay the pricing of this so the benefits are increased safety lower insurance and fuel costs which will benefit and we can see that potentially the first application of this will be in highway and traffic jam autopilot modes but then moving on to urban autopilot in the future and it must be said that the japan and western europe are predicted to be the first adopters of this technology there's lots of stuff going on in japan they, they're doing a whole load of mapping of all of the net road networks in japan so they can drive even if there's snow on the roads at the minute so that they can actually drive cars autonomously so there's a lot of things going on uh, so we see lots of different market predictions uh, so if you look at all the different market there's market predictions and market predictions but there's lots of different ones what they all say is basically we won't have fully autonomous cars until about 2035 so it's still some way off it's we're going to have highly autonomous cars or a lot of uh, highly autonomous cars on the road but not fully autonomous so already we have ADAS systems advanced driver assist systems and partial autonomy and full autonomy uh, is moving in uh, but we're going to see uh, highly autonomous cars dominating the market and we're talking about the 77 billion market as well so it's actually significant so where is this going to be well you probably can't see the colors very well but you can see that actually the markets for the us and europe are about the same in size now that's quite interesting but the key market is the green one which you can't see very well but that is the sort of the uh, southeast asia asia pacific region market that is massive and so if you are going to target this market you really need to be moving into that market because that's where the big opportunity is uh, and this is why we need worldwide standards around this so the biggest opportunities are, are in here and actually in the, as i said the software sector is the one which is likely to benefit most and of course companies like google and ibm are positioning themselves to be in this and there's lots of companies thinking about how they they do that as the, the cars move to to more more and more towards a smartphone on wheels in, in a sense now the other thing which is happening is that car ownership is predicted to decrease <coughs> in the future so we're getting a lot more cars on the road but we won't be owning them in the future we will be uh, just using them as a mobility solution uh, so uber we're going to hear from uber in a minute but basically you can see that they've grown very very rapidly and there's a big interest in self-driving cars because of course if you don't need the driver in the car then that's a cost for for the company and so that's a major benefit and you can see that other companies are positioning themselves as well so gm bought lyft or 500 million dollar stake in Lyft which is a rival to Uber and also they bought cruise automation for 1 billion so they're trying to put these technologies together to try and come up with these mobility solutions for the future and actually it's really a natural fit for self-driving cars if if you have a car that drives itself there's lots of potential applications for 
platform mobility solution providers. So, and also increasingly private ownership is not a high priority for people. So it removes the hassle of driving when it might not be possible. So if you want to go social drinking, for instance, then maybe you don't take a car already, but also you don't have the responsibility for maintaining the car or for insuring the car as well, which are all hassles for people. And so people quite like the idea of this, particularly the younger generation, which more and more are living in urban environments. So they tend to use public transportation more anyway. Interestingly, Elon Musk has also highlighted that he has plans for car sharing around the Tesla, so Tesla owners can actually lend out their cars to other people to share their cars with other people. So this concept is, is becoming more and more prevalent. Now, this does introduce some interesting societal changes. So there are some key changes. First of all, we've got the introduction of the internet connectivity to cars. So we've got far more opportunities for infotainment. So our car could become our office in the future, particularly if it's a self-driving car. We could just sit in it and do whatever we want in the car, do work, surf the internet, etc., listen to music, or actually uh, do something creative. Uh, but the move to autonomous vehicles uh, will improve safety and traffic and reduce emissions, which is all very good. And we've also got these mobility services. And there's many positive impacts of that, but there are threats from this as well. Uh, there's a threat of automation to jobs. So, of course, if we don't need drivers, there's a whole raft of... Uh, jobs which are going to, cha going to change and people need to think about how that impacts society. There's also other interesting quirky things which will happen. So if you get more than about 7% of the cars on the road as autonomous, it actually regulates the whole traffic flow and effectively traffic becomes a train. Now what does that mean? It means if you get up late in the morning to go to work and you wanted to get into the traffic and try and get to work by driving a bit quicker than you normally would do, you've no longer got that option. So it means the whole of society will need to be regulated to do that. Now, the good news is probably be working from home anyway, so, so that, that's the good news. Uh, so there's in some interesting uh, quirk from, from that. So concluding remarks then, first thing is really is that we, there's major research opportunities, and the major research opportunities is really addressing a global market, and you really need to think at the global level in this. It's not just the, the EU and the US. You need to think about the whole world. Uh, there's opportunities uh, both in the vehicles themselves but also in the infrastructure. Uh, and we can see a number of things. Increased automation, there's lots of cyber-physical systems area. We need to think about trust. We need to think about safety. We need to think about liability. How do we deal with those? Also about AI, the, some of the ethical issues of AI, which are to a certain degree overplayed in some of the scenarios I've seen. But there are other issues which we need to try and do, particularly in transparency. We need to understand basically what how the AI is actually making its decisions within some of these uh, systems. Traffic management, big data analytics is very important here, AI for optimization of these systems. Uh, health monitoring, big data analytics again for monitoring systems. Infotainment, 5G has a role to play here, I think, in providing uh, lots of uh, uh, content to people that they might want. But also 5G has very low latency, so you might think about 5G for car-to-car -car communications to a certain degree to actually uh, do braking of cars or tr transfer information between cars. Uh, there's also new opportunities for services. And actually, this is probably the biggest growth area for the future, so I'm very pleased that Uber will be on after me, uh, leading to new players in the market. And an issue will be the societal changes that all of this may bring in the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Ed. <laughs> Malcolm, I believe that was the perfect segue okay. to... It was. Your presentation. Well, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Hayden, as well. Um, and I suppose good afternoon now to everyone here. Uh, my name is Malcolm Glenn. I am. Uh, I manage a lot of our relationships with issue groups and advocacy organizations and nonprofits at Uber right here in D.C. So I took a less than 10-minute Uber to get here. I think it's probably <laughs> the shortest commute of anyone here. And um, I have been at Uber for a little bit more than two and a half years, and unfortunately I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to sit here and hopefully uh, you'll, you won't be too tired from hearing me talk. Um, but I've been at Uber for just over two and a half years, and before I came to Uber, I spent almost three years at Google. And at Google, I was very focused on, uh, I worked very closely with the CFO, and I was very focused on sort of the financial impact of a lot of the work that we were doing. At Uber, I'm very focused on the very practical impact that our technology and platform has, and particularly what that impact looks like from the perspective of traditionally underserved communities. And so that's both the platform as it exists today, as well as potential outcomes for future technologies 
like self-driving vehicles. So it's certainly no secret, and Hayden talked a little bit about our engagement in this space, but we're very, very actively involved. They've made some fairly significant investments in autonomous vehicles over the last number of years for a whole host of reasons. Uh, obviously, there is an economic reason from the perspective of the drivers, but I'll talk a little bit later about why I actually think autonomy will increase the number of drivers, particularly in the short and medium term. Um, but there's some real existential questions um, that we hope to answer by implementing autonomous technology um, that will be quite profound from a global perspective. So thinking about a safety conversation, you know, there are 1.3 million people who die in car crashes every single year. Uh, about 94% of those crashes are the result of human error. So you're talking about more than a million people who die every year around the world in car crashes uh, that could be prevented because they're, because they're the result of some mistake that a person has made. If you try to quantify that in economic terms, autonomous vehicle technology could result in something like $1.4 trillion in savings when you take into account avoided crashes, when you take into account things like congestion delays that are then removed, um, and the efficiency that people have in the time they get back. Um, and then you think about a utilization question, uh, an efficiency question. So for most people, in the United States at least, and in many parts of the world as well, the, most, the second most expensive asset that they will purchase in their entire life is their car after their house. And a car sits idle on average for 95% of the time that you own it. So it is a terrible utilization. It results in cities investing more and more in parking spaces and parking garages and efforts that uh, I think devalue the way that we could be thinking about future infrastructures for cities. And I think the opportunity to open up cities to be used in a more efficient, more effective way is a really exciting proposition for us and something that we're excited to get involved in as we build out this technology. Um, so I think there's a lot of real potential, but the reality is it's a very young field. Um, we have been at this for about three years. We are about a 10-year-old company, about, sorry, about an eight or nine-year-old company. Um, and I think there are a lot of barriers in place that are going to prevent us from getting where we are today to the sort of fully autonomous future that a lot of folks talk about. Uh, and Hayden mentioned some of these things. I think the first thing is the regulatory environment. There is a hodgepodge and a sort of patchwork nature of engaging with autonomous technology thus far, uh, both in the United States and in other parts of the world. Um, there are some bills making their way through the federal government, and there are numerous different ways that states are approaching autonomous vehicle technology legislation, uh, notwithstanding all of the different regulatory environments that are taking place outside the United States. And so we have a long way to go before we get a regulatory framework in place that will allow for some sort of proliferation of autonomous vehicles. The second thing is the technology. And obviously this is a space where lots of companies are investing very heavily, Uber included and getting the technology right where we can get to that level four autonomy that Hayden talked about is still a ways away. And then, of course, there's consumer acceptance. And uh, we looked at the BCG study that talked about leading executives from car companies. But when you look at some of the studies that have asked the general public what they think about this technology, there's still some aversion to it. And I think we have a lot of education to do to get people comfortable with it. And I actually think when you think about the delivery mechanisms for autonomous vehicle technology, this is why a fleet model, a model on top of an existing network like Uber, I think makes a lot of sense in getting people comfortable with autonomous technology without them having to make the investment that one would need if they were buying the car themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. And so we uh, established something we call an advanced technologies group about three years ago, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is the engineering center where we develop our autonomous vehicle technology, where we put the kit on top of existing cars and put the cars out on the road to do testing. And ATG was really established to do, uh, at its core, four different things. And one is ultimately to replace personal vehicle ownership, and that is an exceptionally lofty goal, but a goal that we take very seriously and a goal that we're starting to already cut into. About 10 to 15 percent of Uber riders in surveys that we've conducted have said that the availability of Uber has actually changed their calculus around owning a car. 
and that's just a, in the context of the existing network as it stands today. Obviously, we want to reduce fatalities and injuries and car crashes. We want to reduce carbon emissions and make cities greener. And then we ultimately want to provide affordable and accessible transportation. And you heard a little bit about some of the potential value for people with disabilities, people who are seniors, people with mobility issues. Uh, autonomous vehicle technology has the opportunity to significantly transform mobility for people who have traditionally had a really hard time getting access to transportation. Um, so we have, since the fall of 2016, been testing on the road in a couple of different cities, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Tempe, Arizona, the ones where we've done the most prominent points of testing. Um, but we suffered a real setback a couple of months ago in Tempe, Arizona. I'm sure folks in this room have probably heard about the accident that took place in Tempe in March of 2018 when one of our cars struck and killed a woman who was crossing on a dark road in Tempe, Arizona. Um, it was a horrible tragedy, certainly for her, for her family. Um, and it was also a real setback for our team because ultimately we have a bunch of folks coming to work every day looking to solve big problems. And I don't think they had the expectation, particularly this early in the context of our work, that they were ultimately going to have to deal with a fatality. Um, but as Hayden mentioned, I think this is something that the rest of the industry is also grappling with. The reality is we're not going to go from 1.3 million people dying to zero people dying and certainly not going to do that overnight. And so grappling with the reality that, it, that there are going to be fatalities uh, and we do have to figure out why those things take place and get to the bottom of why the technology potentially didn't work the way we thought it was going to be is a really important, I think, reckoning moment for the industry. What we did in the aftermath of that is we grounded all of our testing vehicles indefinitely. They stay grounded today. Um, and we are working with NHTSA and the NTSB um, in their ongoing investigations to understand exactly what happened. We want to make sure that before we get back on the road, this technology is as safe as possible and we can make sure that we learn what happened in this instance and make sure we mitigate something like this happening going forward. But prior to that, we were making a lot of really significant progress that I think was helping inform the way we think about this. So we had accomplished more than 2 million miles driven in our autonomous vehicles. And we had actually given more than 50,000 Uber X rides in autonomous vehicles. And this means real people requesting an Uber not knowing that they were going to get matched with an autonomous vehicle, having that autonomous vehicle come up and pick, and pick them up. They have the option to say no if they'd rather not take an autonomous vehicle. But the vast majority of people actually said, let's try this. There's a person behind the wheel. There's a person in the front seat collecting data. And so we had 50,000 people take these rides, give us their very important qualitative feedback, and help inform how people think about this technology going forward. And again, this wasn't on test tracks. This wasn't under conditions we could control. This was on real roads with real people. And I think that was really, really important in helping us kind of continue along on this vision that we have. You know, the question, why Uber? You know, there are folks that have been at this for a lot longer than we have. When I was at Google five years ago, one of the only players that was really serious about this work was Google's self-driving pr car project. And now you think about all of the car manufacturers all of the tech companies, the sort of hybrid companies that do transportation and technology like ours, lots and lots of folks recognize the potential in a way that they didn't before. So why do we think we are well equipped in some ways to do well in this space? Well, I think the network really matters. And when you think about the network that we have, 67 different countries, about 450 different cities, we get 15 million rides every single day. We accumulate almost 2 billion miles driven around the world every single month, and that helps inform where people want to go, where it makes sense to deploy and test, and understanding the ways that people think about transportation, that's really, really important. And we have a really significant motivation behind this because we are one of the few companies that has been deeply, deeply ingrained at this context, this confluence of ground transportation and technology. And that's really kind of the core of our business. And so we don't think about this as a sort of side project or as um, something to do kind of away from the core business. This is a very natural progression of the business that we've built over the last eight or nine years. And so I think this is something that is going to continue to be deeply, deeply important to us. Um, so as I mentioned, we were on the road in two different cities. 
and I think we have plans over the long term to launch in more and more cities to do more testing. And so the question we often get is what does it take to launch in a city? And so the first thing we have to do is we have to map the city in extreme high definition. And this is very different than the way that a Google Maps or an Apple Maps or a Waze maps the city for turn-by-turn -turn instructions, but we're mapping the city in high definition down to the centimeter so that our cars can see everything that, that exists in, within a city infrastructure um, and be able to understand what those things are. Um, and as those things change, making sure that they adjust uh, to make sure that they're changing along with it. So we choose set routes. Um, we um, then um, layer our self-driving cars into our existing UberX fleet. And when someone requests a ride that goes along a route that we have mapped and we have programmed for, they may get matched with a self-driving UberX. Um, we're consistently uh, and constantly making adjustments, um, uh, making sure that the cars are adjusting to different um, experiences that they're uh, seeing on the road. Um, and over the course of the time that we've done this, as I mentioned, we've accumulated a lot of data, a lot of miles driven. Um, and, you know, people sort of will often ask us sort of, what's the value of doing this in the real world versus on test tracks? Obviously, there's a greater safety concern, which we've experienced very concretely by doing this on the road. But we think that there's some real valuable data and qualitative information that one can glean from doing this in the real world. And so we're always learning. Um, and that learning never stopped. And so we need to answer some very fundamental questions from our riders. Things like, what does this feel like? Do they like it? Uh, do they trust it? Um, there's an opportunity in the back of a self-driving Uber X ride where you can press a button on the iPad uh, that shows what the li LiDAR is seeing at any given moment to stop the car. Thankfully, we've never had anyone in the 50,000 uh, Uber X self-driving trips that we've conducted decide not to continue their trip. And so we're getting to a level of trust that we didn't have before we conducted this testing. We obviously have a long way to go. 50,000 is a good number, but it's a small drop in a large bucket when it comes to the transportation ecosystem. But we are making progress. And again, this is why I think the fleet model makes the most sense. When you think about some of the things that Hayden mentioned around cost, uh, the Google car is somewhere in the range of $150,000 when you think about all the technology that's put on top of that car. This is going to be prohibitively expensive for many portions of the population, particularly when you think about folks from traditionally underserved communities, um, folks who traditionally have substandard access to transportation and transportation infrastructure. Uh, ferrying this technology into an existing fleet model is a way for people who do not have access to robust resources to take advantage of it. And it's also a way for people to understand whether it's something they feel comfortable with before making that huge investment, even if they can afford that investment. Um, and again, the network of, uh, of our fleet and the degree to which we're already starting to at least change people's calculus around individual car ownership is, I think, something that will only uh, increase when you think about the uh, engagement of self-driving technology. Um, but I think the real future and the real value that one can unlock in the context of the impact on cities, the impact on safety, the impact on efficiency and, ut and utilization is when you think about autonomous cars that are also shared and electric. And there's still some real challenges that we have before we can get to that point. So we think about each of these things individually as they exist on our platform today. Of course, our shared trip um, option is Uber Pool. Uber Pool is about 20% of the trips in the cities where it's operating, and it's about 30 or 40 cities around the world. 20% uh, is great, but we have a long way to go to start to reap the real benefits that one can achieve by having people share rides to get more butts in seats, as we like to say internally. Um, we have a long way to go from electrifying parts of our fleet. We're going to announce a really in exciting initiative today whereby we're going to work with about eight or nine North American cities to get about five million trips uh, through electric vehicles in the next um, year. And we have some really lofty goals in places like London to transition the, 
the cars that our drivers use from diesel to electric vehicles. But there's some real technological challenges as the technology exists today. Uh, as Hayden mentioned, they're very, very power hungry tech. Um, and being able to get that to work with electric vehicles is something we're not quite ready to do yet. Um, and then ov obviously autonomous vehicle technology unlocks a whole host of things from um, an efficiency and a safety trans uh, standpoint. So we think about this as a future that is shared, that is electric, um, that is autonomous. Um, we have a long way to go to get there. And I think the, the other interesting thing to think about is it doesn't necessarily need to only take into account cars. And so we're increasingly thinking about Uber as a mobility platform. Uh, you'll, you'll have seen that we recently purchased a company called Jump Bikes, which is a pedal-assisted company based here in the United States that allows people to, for a very short um, trip, um, pay a very low cost to get a bike um, that locks to any structure in a city and it can get them around. You'll probably have seen the proliferation of scooters in a number of American cities. Um, that's a space that I think is very interesting for us. But then we're also thinking about driving folks to other entities like public transit. So we recently announced a partnership with an organization called Masabi, and Masabi handles ticketing for transit organizations in about 30 different cities all around the world. And so the goal, I think, for us in the future is you can open the Uber app, take a scooter if it makes sense, take a bike if it makes sense, uh, take a self-driving car if it makes sense. We're actually starting to explore um, engagement in the VTOL aircraft space, not the unmanned VTOL aircraft space, but um, you can imagine a future where you can actually get an aircraft to take you where you want to go. Um, autonomy is going to be a part of that, but for the short and medium term, autonomy is still not going to solve for many of the use cases that people have. And just to close, just to give you some perspective of the scale in which we're operating, we're still only less than one half of 1% of miles driven on the road. And when you think about where our ambitions are, so you know, I think it's fairly reasonable that we can get to something like 10 or 15x the size of where we are today in the next 10 or 15 years. And so even if we do that, you're, you're talking about um, right now we have something like 600,000 um, drivers on the road in the United States and about two, two and a half million drivers on the road around the world. Um, even if you think about a future where half to 70% of our fleet in 10 or 15 years is autonomous, you're still talking about a portion based on our scale that is going to be more drivers on the road today, or uh, I'm sorry, more drivers on the road in 10 or 15 years than there are on the road today. Dealing with edge cases like how do we strap in and transport people who use power wheelchairs, and we're building out a fleet of power wheelchairs on our platform today that I think is going to help inform the way we think about it in the future. And so um, I think it's very important to have the conversations around what automation means from the perspective of disruption and changing the way that work uh, that workers engage with, um, with driving. Um, but I think there are actually a number of really unique opportunities that stand to be created by autonomous vehicle technology, and we're excited to figure out how we can help the drivers who are driving on the platform today transition into a future where they can continue to drive and also to think about how we can develop workforce development programs to help drivers who are no longer going to be driving in the future find ways to engage with that new economy in whatever way makes sense for them. So I will stop there. I, I know we may be a little bit pressed for time, so I'd love to make sure we hear from everyone with, with their questions. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So I'm sure we have questions. Yes. Question for Malcolm. Hang on just a moment. Uh, since it's fresh in my, fresh in my mind. Um, clearly and no doubt, Uber is revolutionizing mobility, amazing things that you're talking about. How are you going to bridge, and you're probably thinking about this as well, underserved communities that are not in urban environments that drive uh, the fact that they are under or unemployed because they simply don't have access to a car or even public transportation. It's really uh, you've created and filled supply and demand in very dense uh, locations. How are you going to spread this model? It's a really good question, and it goes back to this thought that I regularly have, which is there was a study a number of years ago that showed that the greatest determining factor as to whether 
someone can climb out of poverty is actually commute time. And so this is very existential when it comes to economic mobility um, and something we're very thoughtful about, literal, L literal uh, economic and other forms of mobility. And so we think about this all the time in terms of getting supply and demand right. We're making some fairly significant inroads. When you think about penetration in the United States, and we don't have exact numbers on what proportion of the population we cover, but we're in remarkably uh, suburban and increasingly um, rural areas, certainly when you think about where we are today versus where we were, say, two, even three years ago. Um, but we haven't covered everywhere. And the further out you are, the more difficult it is to get an Uber. So one of the things that we're thinking about is how can we utilize other parts of the platform to start to engage in rural communities in ways that we haven't before. So one of the things that we launched a number of months ago is a product called Uber Health. And this is a way for hospitals, clinics, other medical institutions to um, actually procure rides, deploy them to people who need to get to non-emergency medical appointments, um, and help those people do so even if they don't have a smartphone. So you can actually sort of sit at a database, get the rides to the right people, get the people to where they need to go. This is increasingly an issue in rural areas. And so non-emergency medical missed appointments um, is a huge, huge strain on hospitals. Um, and it's disproportionately a problem the further and further you get from city centers. And so what we started to do is get hospitals and folks in rural areas more comfortable using Uber through the context of something like Uber Health. Um, that doesn't necessarily solve for the people who are trying to get around who aren't missing their medical appointments who live in rural areas, um, but we recognize that we can control for supply de and demand to some degree, and we've done a pretty good job of that, but to the degree that we have to go outside the traditional model, let's use things like Uber Health. Let's also think about some of the things that, you know, uh, one of the slides from before said that Elon Musk thinks about people using their own personal vehicles to give rides in an autonomous future, even when they're not using it. So you can still buy a car, but you can also still increase utilization and have people sharing your car. Um, that stands to be something that people in rural areas would benefit from disproportionately um, relative to people in urban areas. And so um, we want to eliminate car ownership. The likelihood is that we're not going to do that. And so to the degree that there are people who buy autonomous vehicles and want to make money and increase utilization, I think rural areas is a place to start. But in the meantime, let's use other parts of our platform outside the traditional supply and demand model to see if we can get people in rural areas more engaged with using Uber. a question for anyone who would like to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so in the context of autonomous technology development, who makes decisions around standards for things like safety, security, trust, transparency, and what are the implications for international cooperation? So the who is more often than not is industry driven. Um, I find it interesting, you, you, I mean, you brought up a, a whole list of things, right? So when, when we think about standards, standards are normally, you know, structured around safety. Um, but generally, the the way that the industry standards organizations are built, um, the development of a technology, the, the application, uh, if they're going to talk to each other, if they're going to interact, uh, because you can't, you really can't be safe in an autonomous world unless everything's communicating with everything else. Um, and so setting those standards, whether it be protocols, whether it be the, the types of, of data exchange, um, is generally an industry function. Government is horrifically bad at technology. And so you normally don't want the, your, the, the government setting technology standards that uh, you end up with 30-year-old technology by the time they're done. Um, but, um, and, and you guys pitch in, so. Yeah, no, in, in the aerospace business, certainly you've got the FAA or the CAA in the UK or whoever in, in Europe who sort of regulates what you can do in terms of flying aircraft and also regulates the sort of the weight of the aircraft. So 25 kilograms is a key, a key, key weight within the autonomous aircraft business. In the automotive industry, there's nothing at the minute. There is no outside body to certify anything and so it's up to the automotive companies to do that now the interesting thing there is that as you move forward at the moment we insure a car as a person but 
actually, that doesn't make sense in the future. If you're a passenger in the car and it's autonomous, why would you insure that car? So the insurance liability then has to go to the manufacturer of the car. So it's then the insurance, yeah, so the, the car companies will need to take on that insurance. So there, there is a need for some sort of certification body for cars, but it doesn't exist at the minute. There's, there's various sort of different bodies that represent the industry, but there's not, no outside independent body to do that. There's also some interesting things, because I, I work in from aerospace to nuclear, Okay, if I and rail in between, and in in aerospace we always for for a manned aircraft it's always ten to the six, and it's because your chance of having a heart attack for a pilot is is ten to the six, and so you always have two pilots. You have a pilot and a co-pilot just in case one of them keels over. If you go to uh, the nuclear industry, uh, in the nuclear industry you don't want a person in the loop at all. Everything has to be got. If you want to drop the rods into the reactor. It's totally automated. You get the human out of that because the human is seen as the weak point in the system. And so depending on the certification body, some certification bodies will want a human in the loop. And in the rail industry, they always have it where you have uh, an advisory sent to a human who man makes a decision to do whatever safety action needs to be done. So there's different levels. And so it depends on whether you need a human in the chain or not. And so some industries will claim 10 to the 9 by not having a human in loop, whereas other inter industry will claim 10 to the 6 by having a human in loop. So there's different viewpoints, and you have to educate the whole of the certification bodies as well, and that's a challenge. I think I'll, I'll just add one point mm -hmm. onto what Hayden said. I think it's also the cost model that's associated with that. So, you know, with the unmanned systems, I mean, the whole idea is to try to bring that level, depending on the risk, so maybe 10 to the minus 5, because otherwise you're driving a lot of the companies out of business if you wanted the same certification yeah. level as you do with manned aircraft. Yeah. I'd like, oh yeah. I'd like to find out more about the incident in the Tempe where the pedestrian was killed by the autonomous vehicle. Was the circumstance, did she dart out in front of the moving vehicle so the vehicle did not have time to stop or, uh, or, or you know, or w would it have been any different had it been driven vehicle? Or, you know, if you dart out in front of a moving vehicle, uh, regardless of whether it's a, a, a bus, a train, a plane, a driven vehicle, or autonomous, would not would that issue be the same? Uh, you, know, you know, if you, you know, comp com uh, compared to, say, you know, um, I just saw the other day, you know, a drunk driver in Michigan sentenced for killing five bicyclists while drunk. You know, w uh, why is... Um, now, why is the issue so, so great that there's so much great tragic when an autonomous vehicle hits a pedestrian than when a driven vehicle hits the pedestrian? Uh, I, I'm not sure what the circumstances were. Yep. Yeah. You know, but and, and, and uh, also in the rural areas w with the autonomous vehicles, from personal experience, I know straight away driving in rural areas at nighttime <coughs> that, uh, that you can deal with, like deer crossing the road, mm -hmm. more than one. So is it, have you, you know, it would it be any different yep. with that pedestrian tempe than with a deer crossing the road, you know? So I guess, I don't know what the issue was in Tempe, but wha wha why is it so much greater a tragedy when a Thomas vehicle hits a pedestrian than when a driven vehicle hits it? I, would that, you know, I, you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, it yeah. They, I, I'm happy to answer just about the spe specifics of the Uber um, question. You know, we want to find out what happened too, and so um, we grounded our vehicles, which was good from the perspective of helping people feel safe in the aftermath of a tragedy, but also means that we don't necessarily know exactly what happened. So we're co cooperating with the two investigations, and once they issue their full reports, I think that'll help shed some light on it. You know, I think the, the broader question, why do people perceive a uh, pedestrian death with an autonomous vehicle is different than the 6,000 pedestrian deaths that take place just in the United States every single year, none of which get any... Um, really news coverage is because part of our stated and, and very sort of existential reason for making these investments is because of the safety calculation is we want to save lives and so I think people are thoughtful about the autonomous technology not doing that and what that potentially means. I think the other reason is because there is some fundamental um, distrust and lack of awareness around autonomous vehicle technology and so if people uh, have misperceptions or fears about this technology and they see a story 
about a person dying as a result of a self-driving technology. That confirms a lot of fears that they already have, and I think that results in them reacting in a, in a, in a more um, outsized way than, than what the nature of the tragedy is. Um, you know, in terms of the technology, should the technology be able to see a deer at, at night? Should they be able to see a person darting out at night? That's the goal. That's exactly what we're trying to mitigate against. So even if it's dark, it doesn't matter. A person wouldn't be able to see a person in the dark. But the goal is to get the technology to a place where the technology can see those people. Um, and so we can avoid situations like this going forward. It's, it's interesting because there have been some studies in, of, of people's reactions to, to the technology. And what they found is it really needs to be a thousand times safer before they will accept the technology, and that's a fundamental issue. But I think you get down to the ethical question of how many people are dying a day. 6,000 6, pedestrians. So we uh, could introduce a technology tomorrow which would reduce that by a significant proportion. And also the, all of the costs of insurance costs for hospital for the people who are badly injured, which is also a big issue. I mean, ethically, should we just go with the technology or, or not? And that, that's the big question for society. I mean, people talk about the ethics of a few people being killed by the technology, but actually, ethically, can we not introduce this technology because we would save thousands of lives immediately? And that's the point that we, we constantly get to. I can tell you that the last 15 years I've been hit, hitting this on the unmanned aircraft system standpoint is that I can demonstrate conclusively that using unmanned aircraft systems in a variety of applications guarantees that fewer people will die. Guarantees it. But the level of trust that people want to put into an automated system, we, we do expect perfection, right? Yeah. And so, for, the, for example, the few deaths from the Tesla autopilot, right? Um, the, the, the people who were driving those cars tended to be early adopters, high-tech kind of people. That, that's the reason they have a Tesla. And the system works remarkably well. 99.99, it's going to work really well. It's going to hold your lane. It's going to slow down when, when it's coming up on another car. It works really well. It's a driver assist. It's never marketed as anything else, which means you're supposed to sort of keep situational awareness you're supposed to keep your hands near or on the wheel just in case, right? But we begin to trust it. We get comfortable with it because it works so well. And so next thing you know, people are reading books, their heads down, they're, they're, they're writing novels on their phone. Um, and by the time they look up and they, they begin to ignore alarms, right? So in most of the Tesla uh, accidents, the alarm went off. And in some cases up to six seconds before impact, and the person behind the wheel, in one case, did not put their hands on the wheel after six seconds of alarm. And so that, that, that tells me that that person's probably very comfortable with the system and had alarmed for them a few times before, but it took care of it. And so, once again, your mind starts to wander. So you, you, there's, there's not enough trust of automation, and there can be too much trust of automation. Until we get it to an infinitesimal number of, of nines, there are going to be situations where wrecks are going to happen. But I will submit that we're already at the point where far fewer wrecks would happen if everyone had this technology at their disposal. So the acceptable loss is one of perception. Uh, we accept that humans are, are not perfect and that you know, they're going to make bad decisions. Um, we can accept that and we live with it because we are. We expect so much more out of our technology. Yeah. I mean, I used to design control systems for jet engines, and basically there we would design the control system to survive a fire for two minutes. And the reasoning behind that was is that the pilot won't see the alarm straight away. So the pilot will be doing something, and then they might catch the alarm that they see. And so you need to be able to design in that factor that the human is there and won't always do what you expect when you expect them to. All right, I've been given the sign that we have one last question. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so going back to the fact that this is transatlantic collaboration, I had a question uh, linked to an area of collaboration. So you mentioned that there was a lot of work to map the routes to the centimeter. This is mobility across the city. So it's work that can be shared by different, uh, not only Uber, I mean, there are public authorities, etc. So my question is, is this a concrete area of collaboration that could be taken up in Europe, in the US, across, I mean, the world, because as you said before, there's the world, um, that could be started concretely to speed up the uptake of mobility? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it 
I think the answer is yes. And I think in part the answer is yes because we don't necessarily need every car, even on the Uber network, and there are going to be other networks, we don't need every car to be an Uber technology car. So part of the reason I think it's really good that there are so many other players doing this testing in other cities is because we see a future where some of the cars that you request may be cars that are fed to you by Uber. Some of them may be fed to you by other technology companies that have invested in this themselves, that have mapped cities themselves, um, that are looking for basically a means of deployment, and Uber is that means of deployment. So when you request a ride, you don't actually know from sort of what entity that car comes. It's exactly the same experience for the end user. But on the back end, it could have been a company from a different country. It could have been a company that is investing in a slightly different way, that's only working on the LiDAR, that's only working on the HD maps. And so I think we're still relatively early in the space to see what robust deployment looks like. But at a core level, yes, the more people that are investing in the space and building out the technology and the quicker we can get the technology to a place where it does work in such a way that people are comfortable with it, and you have these networks like ours that can help deploy that technology in a really robust and quick way, I think that's just going to mean it gets into the hands of people more quickly. So more people investing in this, I think, is better for everyone. Let me say again, thank you to our panel. I think we've had a fascinating conversation and series of presentations, and help me uh, give them a, a thank you.